Hi guys, Allie here from Maine's Confetti Quail Farm. All right, I don't see a uh, option to share this out. So hopefully enough of you will get notified. Um, after the video is done, I'll go and share it to our different pages. So hopefully you'll be able to catch the replay. But I wanted to do a follow-up video um, and obviously chat with you guys if you have any questions regarding this topic. But um, I went live with Terry last week, last Tuesday, and we talked about color genetics and basic questions that you guys had. Um, but there was a topic or a question that came up regarding breeding true. And the question wasn't exactly what I'm going to cover today, but it prompted this video. I think breeding true, hatching true, um, those are terms that are thrown a lot, around a lot in a way that um, may be confusing for people who are trying to start breeding their own stock and trying to be intentional with what they're breeding to what, to produce what. <laughs> so I wanna talk about what breeding true is or what hatching true is as far as I see it. Um, that's an opinion based thing, I guess. But my view on that, and I'm gonna go over a list of some of the more common mutations that do or should uh, breed true, hatch true. So I have an introduction post to this that I put up in the Coternix Corner group. So if you've seen that, this is just to expand on that. Basically, breeding true, hatching true, means that you can breed two birds together of the same mutation or same variety and expect to get 100% of that offspring to look just like the parents. Um, that's what I think breeding true is and what I think the term should mean. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, general videos that are up that people talk, when they talk about breeding true, they'll say things like 80% breeds true, 20% does not breed true. That was a source of a lot of confusion for me personally when I started out because I thought that those numbers or those percentages was a normal occurrence. I didn't know anything really about how the genetics works. I just thought, oh, well, maybe that's just how it's supposed to be. If I get 80% of something and 20% of something else, that's just how it is. And um, that's how lines work. And there's always going to be these additional genes that pop up just because of past breeding, um, things that you can never get out of that line. And that's actually not accurate. And, um, there are things that we can do if you feel like you want to. There's steps that you can take to test breed and make sure that the stock that you're working with does breed true if it's one of those mutations that should. So some of the mutations, well, actually, I'll just go over one of the, one of the key things that I put here for why breeding true is something that some people um, will set a goal for. And what it does, it creates consistency within your flock. So if you're breeding just for yourself and it's just a hobby project, you're probably not gonna be very concerned about it. The reason why I am concerned about it is because I wanna be able to market um, one of my lines or all of my lines, preferably, as lines that offer specific results when they're in homozygous form. So if I were to uh, offer hatching eggs for, let's say, Manchurians, I want my customers to receive their eggs, to incubate their eggs, and then see 100% Manchurians in their incubator. Um, so what they order is what they get, and it's what they expect. So a lot of times um, when we have lines to work on, they come with those genes that we need to perfect. Um, we need to clean lines up. So honestly, most of my lines are not at that point where they breed true right now. The most important line, I think, uh, that should always breed true is Faro because Faro is one of your main feather sexable colors or plumage varieties. And it's, it's the foundation 
of what you're working with when you're doing any kind of color breeding projects or color testing, things like that. If you have mixed genes that are popping up within your ferro line, that's going to be something that will continue on, continue on, continue on if you don't really take care of it. So that is the first uh, variety that I would say should absolutely breed true. If it does not breed true and you have 10%, 20% of something popping out, um, commonly it's dotted white because dotted white in a heterozygous form can be kind of tricky to see on pharaohs. Most of the time it's just a little white spot on the bib or a white spot on the chest or you might see some primary feathers that are white. Um, but that's usually what you'll see that is popping out of your fair line if it has not been cleaned up fully. Um, and the reason for that is pharaohs, when, when people buy pharaohs, typically within the United States, it's a jumbo line. Hi, Dale. And those pharaohs have been crossed with other jumbo lines like uh, Texas A&M, for example, like those English white birds to increase the size on those pharaohs. That's why we can see those residual genes in there. Um, and that's why those particular ones are common. But the next uh, variety that can 100% breed true is Manchurian because Manchurian is homozygous for fawn. So homozygous fawn parent to homozygous fawn parent will always produce 100% homozygous offspring of the fawn gene or whatever gene that you're working with. Tibetan uh, is another one. Again, homozygous for extended brown, homozygous for extended brown produces 100% or should produce 100% Tibetan. Range, Egyptian, uh, Egyptian fee, Amber Manchurian, Sandy, Sandy Faro, or Sandy on EB, sorry, Sandy Faro, Fab Fee, Pearl Fee. Um, there's, there's, guys, there's a really big list here. Um, just to give you a couple more though. Homozygous calico, English white, homozygous white wing pied, rotkoff, pansy fee, red pansy, homozygous blue, which looks white, uh, homozygous lavender on pharaoh, and OZ snowy, if you're in Australia, that's another one. So there are some varieties that you will never ever get to breed true. And those are varieties that include parents that have a combination of genetics that are uh, heterozygous for a certain mutation. So um, hmm, an example of that would be Italian. Italians are heterozygous for fawn. That's what they are. That's what the variety is. Heterozygous for fawn and it's on a wild type. It's crossed with wild type and that's what you get. The reason why you will not get an Italian line that hatches true is because each of those parents, if you put Italian to Italian, you have one copy of fawn in each one of those birds. The babies are going to grab one copy of something from mom, one copy of something from dad. With that combination there, that baby has the opportunity to grab two copies of fawn and be Manchurian, it has the opportunity to grab two copies of wild and be pharaoh. It also has the opportunity to grab one copy of fawn from mom or dad, and then just the wild, no fawn from mom or dad, and that would produce an Italian. So if you're breeding Italian to Italian, you're actually getting pharaoh, Italian, and Manchurian babies from that cross, and that's how it should be. Um, let's see. There is another spin on things, and it is you can put a breeding group together of two different varieties and be able to produce 100% of a certain type of variety for the offspring. So this I don't think would really count as a breeding true because the babies aren't going to look exactly like the parents, but you are producing 100% baby is looking all the same. Hello, tuxedo, exactly. Dale knew where I was going with that. Yes, tuxedo. 
So to give you an example of this, if you guys were to order tuxedo eggs from someone, um, this is how you would set up this breeding group. You would have homozygous dotted white or English white and homozygous Tibetan, for example, if we're doing uh, the common tuxedo. What that would produce is a baby in between. Since you have two homozygous parents that they have, they're homozygous for two different mutations, those babies all have to grab one copy of what this bird is homozygous for and then one copy of what this bird is homozygous for. And they're going to end up being that same combination because there's only, there's only an option for, for one thing from each parent. So for example, if you have uh, English white moms, that baby is going to grab one copy of her dotted white. Okay, so it has one copy of dotted white, and then that baby is also going to grab one copy of extended brown from dad because he only has extended brown, two copies of extended brown. So that baby's going to end up with one copy of extended brown and one copy of dotted white, and 100% of those babies are going to be Rosetta tuxedos because Rosetta is heterozygous heterozygous for extended brown and heterozygous for dotted white. All of those babies should look the same. So if you um, are working with mutations that, that fall in between other mutations, you can set up certain breeding projects that will produce 100% of a certain thing, depending on what genetics you're working with. Um, but you have to start with something different, okay? so. Tuxedo to tuxedo, for example, is not going to give you 100% tuxedos. It's going to do the same thing. It's going to, it's, those babies are going to grab something, grab something, and they're going to be whatever combination they end up being. Uh, not all the same with each other. Um, hi, David. Hi. So I think I covered mainly what I wanted to cover as far as what breeding true means, um, if you have any questions about it, let me know in the comments. I don't think I see any questions so far. Um, so this is something just to kind of keep in mind. When you are looking into uh, a bloodline, if you're looking into getting hatching eggs from someone, um, just make sure that you have that conver conversation with your breeder so you know what to expect because if you purchase something and you're thinking that it's going to be one thing and then you end up with a bunch of stuff, um, that can be something that will set you back if color breeding is one of your goals. Um, or even just simple identification. You may be like, oh, I thought I was gonna end up with this and then now I have this, what's this, what's this, what's this? And then you're, you're playing with a bunch of other things that you really may or may not understand what it's going to produce from um, when you breed it for the next generation. Why can't we use white males and say Rosetta hens for tuxedos? Okay, so you can. You can absolutely do that, but that what that will do, Dale, is it will produce uh, Rosetta tuxedos as well as Pharaoh tuxedos. Because if you have a white, or if you have a white male who's homozygous for um, dotted white, there's two copies of that dotted white. Rosetta hen would be a one copy of um, extended brown, EB, and one copy pharaoh. Okay, it's only got one copy of EB in there. So those babies are going to grab automatically one copy of the uh, dotted white from dad, and then either the one copy of extended brown or pharaoh. So you're gonna end up with two varieties of babies from that cross, which is totally fine. Um, if you want all babies to be tuxedo though, you have to pick the white and a bird that is homozygous uh, for an also dominant trait, okay? Did that answer your question, I hope? Hi, Rick. Ooh, that light got really intense all of a sudden. Sorry, I'm like glow in the dark. Um, 
I'll give you guys a couple more minutes to post any kind of questions you have. And I think I'm gonna pull up that list one more time um, just to see if there's anything else that I can go into. Okay, let me go into Pearl Fee too, because this is a confusing one. Pearl Fee is one that's tricky for people to get um, to hatch out all Pearl Fee. That's one of those more common lines that you'll get a collection for. And the reason why Pearl can be confusing, sorry, that light, confusing is the Italian-based Pearl is also called the same as a Mancharian-based Pearl. They're both called Pearl Fee but their base patterns are actually heterozygous for fawn and then homozygous for fawn. And then on top of that, they can be either heterozygous for fee or homozygous for fee. So you may have a box of pearl fee and then hatch them out and you could get a whole bunch of variations from uh, those pearl fees because of those different areas that they can be either heterozygous or homozygous. If you have the goal of producing 100% pearl fees for your line that you're offering to people, you need to make sure that you have bred your birds in a way that every single bird is homozygous for fee. So there isn't gonna be any brown, it's got two copies of fee in there, and also, the base pattern that that is on, all of those birds need to be on the Mancharian base pattern, okay? If you have one of those pearl fees that's on an Italian base pattern, um, or, adds, or if you have a couple of those that are on the Italian base pattern, you're going to end up with, you could end up with Faro or Fab Fee. So it would be a Faro with Fee. That's why you're getting Fab Fee from your, from your um, pearl breeders. Okay. So some of these uh, varieties have the same name and they're actually made up of different genetics. Uh, Grau fee is the same, same situation. Grau fee, uh, you can consider a Rosetta with fee. Grau fee, you can consider um, a Tibetan with fee, also called Grau fee. And again, they can be heterozygous or homozygous for fee. So those are um, some trickier ones to, to breed for, just because you're working with two genes that you need to be homozygous instead of just one. We have run a few lines of different tucks. We'll add a couple of switch to see what you get. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, nothing else is really screaming out at me as far as something that I wanted to cover. Not really. Not really. I think that was, I think that's good for, we'll leave it for, um, for now at where we are here. And if you guys have questions, um, post them in the comments. I will get to them in additional posts or I'll answer your questions in the comment area. But, um, Hopefully this gives you guys some clarity as far as what you should expect from different orders that you place and how you can design your different breeding programs to be able to give people really what they're expecting, okay? All right, so I hope you have a great day, guys. I'll talk to you really soon.